Geology. Geology. Mini Geology. Good morning, everybody from Houston, beautiful Montrose headquarters. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Mini Geology Radio Show, where we talk about geology and the relationship between geology with uh, all the rest of the world. The other disciplines, life, work, society, theology, everything. And uh, today we are going to talk about the beauty of the landscapes and the scenic touristic places that we generally visit when we are tourists and we're going to try to explain you a little bit about uh, in which way geology plays a role in shaping in reshaping in shining the landscape that you go and you admire and you take a lot of pictures of that so today we have in the house uh, my very good friend and colleague Steve Bergman. Good morning, Steve. Good morning, Daniel, and good morning, Petroplex. What is Petroplex? Petrometro? Uh, Petrometroplex. <laughs> what is that? This city? <laughs> Houston? The city of Houston. This fantastic locus of exploration. Uh, what do you mean by exploration? Exploring the world, exploring nature, trying to keep everyone energized with fuel. Okay, okay, okay. So you see Houston as the Petrometro. Uh, based on the oil and gas industry and many other things yeah in fact we have talked about that and the reason why we start having this uh, oil and gas hub here in Houston related to the opening of the channel that connect the port with the city in 1914 that was the beginning oh. of uh, all of this uh, magnet that is Houston for geologists a very rich legacy indeed yeah and um, Steve, I remember we have been out in the field so many times because you have to know that we geologists in spe specific, uh, Steve in here and uh, myself, we have been out uh, looking at the rocks, uh, looking at the outcrops, uh, describing mountains, taking pictures, taking samples for analysis in a lot of different places. And we worked hard and we had a lot of fun together. It's one of the beauties of geology because you get paid to do what many people pay to do. <laughs> and you that you are listening, if you remember times when you were going out in the field, and all of you, if you are geoscientists, you did. And that is probably the core of uh, uh, your studies. You will always remember. If you remember those days and you don't do it anymore, we're here to remember those times and to uh, and, to, and to try to revamp that holy fire that you have inside about geology. You know, you know, you know that you want to go back to the field, but you know there's no possibility, you cannot really do it, your managers don't approve, you, know, you don't have anything to do with the outcrops anymore. But that was the core of geology, going and stay with the rocks. It's the reason most geoscientists go into the field, because of their love of the earth and the nature. And even if you study something else, geophysics, geochemistry, petrography, and uh, you need to look at these rocks. And by the way, these rocks, they, as I said, they are so reshaped and remodeled by the deep earth in the shallow processes on the crust. But then we see them. Somebody decided we have to go to specific places, but those places that are very nice because of geology. Yeah, magical. Yeah. Every rock tells a story, and they capture this fantastic history uh, of the Earth's evolution over the last four and a half billion years. It's just amazing. And uh, Steve, like one of the main uh, places where we go uh, for tourism and, re and in relationship with geology is certainly the Grand Canyon. Yes. So, uh, the, the Grand Canyon, do you want uh, tell us something geologically about these spectacular landscapes? Well, there's been a lot of controversy about the geologic evolution of the Grand Canyon uh, in the last 10 years. And 
there's the one group of geoscientists that believe that it's very young, only five or six million years old, in, uh, which in geologic terms is very young. And the other group believes it's been there for a long time, 70 million years or so. So there's new geologic evidence and geochronologic evidence where we date the minerals in the rocks that tell us that it could be as young as five million years. So, so during that time, you've exposed over 1.8 billion years of geological time okay, recorded in the so rocks. So the canyon form in between 17 and 5 million years? 70. Seven zero oh, and 70, five. Either yeah. 70 or 5. And yes. The canyon, the erosion. The erosion. And the erosion is eroding uh, rocks and formations that they uh, have a time span of 1.8 billion years. So the first rocks that you see at the bottom of the canyon are Precambrian in age, 2 billion years old. And because of the uplift that the Colorado Plateau has experienced, um, the reason the 70 million year model is out there is because there was a big event uh, the, called the Laramide Orogeny, a mountain building event that started around 70 million years ago. And that was the re prevailing theory for 50 years. Uh, but just recently, in 10, mil 10 years ago, uh, this new data became available based on appetite fission track analysis, which is amazing a technique in itself. Uh, that suggests that it's much younger, only five to six million years old. And why does it happen exactly there? Why do we have the Grand Canyon there and only there, and there are not other big, great Well, there Grand are canyons. other, there are other portions of um, canyons. Chaco Canyon on the Gunnison River is a similar canyon uh, on the Colorado Plateau that exposes very ancient rocks, and it's a deep canyon, but it's much narrower. Um, and and there's plenty of other canyons all over the world and many other continents. But the Grand Canyon is exceptional because of its length and its width and its depth and it, the, the rich legacy. If, if anyone has ever stood on the margin of the canyon and seen it, it just takes your breath away. So tell us more about this uplift. The reason why we have 1.8 billion years exposing there is because the rocks that they were deeply buried, they little by little they are uplifted. Very slowly uplifted at uh, rates of meters to sometimes kilometers per million years, but meters to hundreds of meters per million years, they're uh, uplifted because of plate processes. This is where the plates compress, they squeeze the lithosphere, the, the rigid outer shell of the earth, and they result in uplift. So while that terrain is uh, being uplifted, you have a river that is cutting through? As long as you have rivers that can erode, and we have the beautiful Colorado River that has a big drainage basin, plenty of water uh, to erode the rocks and uh, pluck away all the different grains of sand and take them out into the ocean, into the Salton Sea, eventually. Another one, um, uh, Yellowstone. Something about Yellowstone. Yellowstone is amazing. The last major eruption of this 45-mile-wide caldera, imagine a volcano 45 miles wide, uh, was 630,000 years ago. It's erupted three major times in the last two million years, and we're overdue for another eruption at Yellowstone. And this is an exception. What does it mean it is overdue? Well, because usually it's about every uh, 600 million years or so on average, 620. And now uh, the last one was... 600,000. Thousand years, sorry, yeah. thousand years. Yeah. And so we're due for an eruption, a major eruption. So it's kind of like... We are waiting for it? We're waiting for it. But it could be in a thousand years, it could be in a hundred thousand years, but certainly in the next 50 to a hundred thousand years. So there the, are models? There are models. There are the predictions, thing. but we see evidence. We see major uplift in the region. There's seismic activity. But the beauty of, of Yellowstone is the fact that it's one of our few hot spots that we have on uh, well, the North American so, continent. Uh, so uh, this is similar to the concept of the uh, wait, waiting for the big one. 
in California. So exactly. why don't we why don't we know that much about Yellowstone? Well, we're we're at a very primitive state at understanding how to predict earthquakes and volcanoes. Uh, we don't have enough data, enough monitors, enough listening posts to understand the activity of the Earth's interior. So maybe it's because there's way more people living around San Francisco and L.A. That's why we listening to the news about the uh, big one rather than the big one in Yellowstone. And the frequency of uh, earthquakes uh, along the California plate boundary is a lot greater than the frequency of 600,000 year eruptions in in Yellowstone. So it, it it's a very uh, long period frequency that uh, exists for for the Yellowstone caldera anyway. Well, but talking about the um, uh, the the um, uh, San Andreas fault. So yes. San Andreas fault is uh, a plane. It's a vertical fault that is going from San Francisco to LA. North of San Francisco, um, it, it goes all the way uh, to south of LA into the Gulf of California. It's 800 miles long uh, in California, uh, and it, it is an amazing structure. It's a plate boundary. It's the boundary between the Pacific Plate and the North American Plate. The Pacific Plate is moving northwest. Eventually, uh, part of San Francisco, the west part on the west side of the fault, will end up in Alaska. What? <laughs> in, in just less than 50 million years. If you have any real estate in the west part of the San Andreas Fault, you will be living in Alaska. And at that time, it should be pretty warm. <laughs> we should be in a greenhouse by that time, yes. Uh, you were mentioning hotspot relationship with Yellowstone. Tell us what is a hotspot. Uh, uh, hot hot spot. Hot spots. They're amazing. They're places where the Earth's core mantle boundary over 2,000 miles below the surface, heats up and rises in a solid state, uh, like a lava lamp. And the mantle is rising, it's buoyant, it's light and uh, low density, and it rises up, and when it gets close to the surface, within about 100 miles of the surface, it melts. And that mantle melts and creates magma, and the magma rises up and erupts at the surface. And so this hotspot has been moving. It used to be out in the Pacific coast, right in Oregon and Washington, about 50 million years ago, and created a huge mass of uh, outpourings called the Celestia terrain, which is the basement of the Pacific Northwest in Seattle and Northern Oregon. And then that terrain was accreted and added to North America, and then the hot spot continued to move, and it made the Columbia River basalts, this huge outpouring 16 million years ago of massive flood basalts that were erupted from Idaho all the way to the ocean in the Pacific, over 500 miles long. And you can go to the Columbia River and see these beautiful columnar jointed lavas. So that is where we have the Columbia Gorge? The Columbia Gorge. The Gorgeous correct. Gorge. The Gorgeous Gorge, yes, it's one of the most beautiful places in the world. These beautiful black columnar jointed lavas, big columns like Devil's Post Pile. And then as the plate moved over the hot spot, at 10 million years ago, we erupted huge calderas in Idaho. And there are many volcanic ash deposits that you can find in the Gulf of Mexico that blew into the upper atmosphere and the winds blew them into the Gulf 10 million years ago. And then finally, today, we have the hotspot sitting underneath Wyoming, creating the Yellowstone hotspot and the Yellowstone caldera and all the hot springs. There's over 300 geysers, the most in the world of a small area. Tell us what is a geyser. A geyser is a fumarole where hot water is, is forming deep in the subsurface. In the a funeral? A, a fumarole. I know. What is a fumarole? <laughs> And not a fumarola. <laughs> a fumarola. Fumarole. Fumarola. Fumarola. No, Steve. Fumarola. Fumarola. Okay. Good. Thank you. Tell us what is a fumarola. A fumarola is where the rocks are hot enough to heat the water and cause them to boil, and at great depth. It, and they it, create smoke. They create steam. Okay. Not Which smoke, is, steam. Okay. Well, vapor, okay. water vapor. You know, because I translate fumo in smoke, instead <laughs> fumo could be also s s 
so in this case, there's there is no fire. There is just steam. Yeah. Um, and so these geysers are water vapor that and water liquid that is boiling and bubbling up, and it forms these pots of sometimes boiling mud and boiling water. And the Old Faithful geyser is one of the most famous ones. It's very periodic in its history because it, its periodicity of eruption, you can go and almost set your clock to its uh, performing and giving us a wonderful show. Geyser, is it geyser? <clears throat> I don't know the etymology of geyser, but it seems it comes from Ireland. It's from Iceland. Iceland. Yes. And some people call it geyser. <laughs> Maybe and, Italian? <laughs> <laughs> I think the British call it geysers and yeah. Australians and New Zealanders. No, we say uh, geyser. I like geyser. I think geyser is... Geyser, it, it makes yeah. you think of people like us, these old people. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, so, so, and then what happened? Then Because we were moving with the hot, uh, hot so spot. So the, the hot spot yep. is stationary in the mantle, but the plate is moving over it. And so these hotspot tracks form all over the world. We have some in the Canary Islands. There's some in Hawaii. Hawaii is a beautiful example of a hotspot chain. Okay, and that is another scenic touristic place. The Kilauea volcano is amazing. So all of the uh, islands of Hawaii, they are the result of hotspots? Of the movement of the Pacific Plate over this mantle hotspot, a different mantle hotspot. Uh, and it's it's over 10,000 miles long. It goes all the way to the Emperor chain. It's being subducted underneath the Aleutian Islands up in Alaska. And it's an amazing chain. Most of the volcanoes, though, in the Hawaiian chain are submerged. Uh, they're underwater. How many? At With level. respect to the islands? More than the number? Oh, many islands? more than the islands. Yeah, we're only seeing the very young ones exposed as islands. But Kilauea is amazing because it sits on the Mauna Kea uh, volcano, uh, which is the tallest mountain on Earth, if you measure it from its base. It's, it's amazing. You mean from the seafloor? From the seafloor, so the you, base. This is like, uh, I think I remember, 30,000 feet. It's 30,000 feet below the base. Let me calculate that. Brrr, could it be around 10 kilometers? Around 10 kilometers. 10 yes. kilometers. And Mount Everest is 8? 20, it's 8.5 kilometers. So it's yep. taller than Mount Everest. You're good at translating from <laughs> kilometers to <laughs> miles and feet. Yeah, Mount Everest is 23,050 feet or so. Well, but on Mars we have a mountain that is... Oh, a much bigger. A much bigger volcano and a much higher. Yeah, it's the biggest volcano that has been recognized in the solar system. But we haven't had any field trips there yet, unfortunately. Well, it so, would be fun to go. Well, yeah. Yeah, for sure. I think that they're training the new generation to go there in 2035. So soon. Yep. I, yeah, I'm telling my kids to be prepared. So the beauty of Kilauea, even though it's this large, huge, uh, massive mountain volcano, it's a shield volcano, but it's had the active Pu'ua'u event since the 3rd of January in 1983. It's been erupting continuously. What did you say, Pu'u? -pu? Pu'ua'ua. What is that? It's a Hawaiian name for the vent. It's a fissure and basaltic magma uh, at 1,200 degrees centigrade is bubbling out and forming a river of lava that eventually enters the sea and you can see it steaming and forming a, a lava fall into the ocean so that is a name for the effusive uh... it's the individual vent that's okay. leaking the magma chamber out to the surface but the hawaiian volcanoes they give a name for a specific way or of uh explosion or, you know, effusive uh, uh, processes, right? Yes, what, right. Is, what, what is that name? Hawaiian, just Hawaiian? Well, it's a type of eruption. So the Kilauea vent is erupting very quietly in these uh, basalt lavas that come out. Uh, they're called effusive eruptions instead of explosive eruptions. Rarely they explode, and, you, and a number of... Uh, Explosive eruptions in Hawaii have killed the local inhabitants back in the 17 and 1800s, but mostly they're very quiet, and you can almost walk right up to the vent and stand on it, uh, even though it's red hot, 1200 degrees centigrade lava. Well, and then talking about names of explosions, 
uh, <clears throat> that they derive from the name of volcanoes. In Italy, we have at least three. So the most explosive, which is the Plinian, and that is uh, the story of uh, Plinio the Young, <clears throat> who was describing the explosion of the Vesuvius uh, in 79 uh, after. AD. Yes, AD. And uh, he was describing the explosion of the volcano that uh, covered with five meters of ashes Pompeii and Arcolano, which are now another a key touristic place for archaeological uh, reasons, but still is the geology that generates these parts. And so you have the Plinian explosion, which is pretty... The most uh, explosive. The most explosive. These are caldera eruptions that inject ash into the stratosphere, 50 miles above the surface. So he was on the... Um, there's a gulf in Naples. He was on one side of the gulf. He was looking at the other side of the gulf where you have the volcano that is very close to the coast, to the city of Naples. At that time, the city was not there. You have Pompeii and their Colano, and he was describing it. He was obviously describing it in Latin. And uh, he described also the death of his uncle, Plinio el Vecchio, Plinio the Elder. And uh, in his writings, uh, his writings, we had to translate them when we were at school studying Latin. Oh, how lucky. <laughs> <laughs> so is that what got you interested in geology? Uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> that was not a series of coincidents. Uh, like the stars, they align one day and they say to me, geology will be. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll talk about that one of these days. But uh, then another uh, name derived from uh, the... Uh, Italian volcanoes is the Volcano Island. Uh, the Volcano Island and the Stromboli Island, both of them are right north of Sicily. There are a cluster of a very few islands, I think seven of them, and they are uh, north of Sicily. They are um, part of the uh, human heritage protected by UNESCO, hmm. like many other of these beautiful places that we're describing. And um, the Volcano Island is the one that in the mythology uh, host the uh, god Volcano, who was inside. He was a blacksmith. Yeah, Vulcan. Yep, Vulcan. And he was there, you know, while he was working, the volcano was exploding. <laughs> uh, and then Stromboli, which is uh, very close by there, and the Stromboli, Stromboliana explosion. Explosive cinders erupt out and are injected into the, maybe a kilometer or two, not very high into the atmosphere. And there's also Surtsean eruptions, named after the volcano in Iceland, the Surtsey volcano. It's an island right outside of Iceland. And those are effusive eruptions that inject magma into the air and make these fire fountains. What else? Uh, where do we go now? So, since we're speaking of Surtsey, we have another hotspot, Iceland, which is right on the plate boundary between the North American plate and the Eurasian plate. And it's another place where you can stand on one plate with your left foot and the other plate with the right foot. And if you wait long enough, your legs will be doing the splits because the <laughs> plates are moving apart at about three and a half centimeters per year. You'd have to wait a long time, though, at the rate your fingernails grow. So you have to be very patient, like all geologists, waiting for geologic processes to activate. <laughs> but Iceland is amazing. Uh, they've got glaciers and these fantastic volcanoes and hot springs. Well, my daughter was just there. Uh, with her boyfriend last summer and she circled the ring road and was able to camp virtually anywhere and see some of the most spectacular uh, sights of uh, these beautiful waterfalls that are just unbelievable on these columnar jointed basalt lavas. So very friendly people in Iceland and fantastic scenery. It's wonderful to have such a diversity of landscapes with fire and ice right in in, in your backyard. 
Uh, <clears throat> it seems you are a volcanologist, Steve. I, I enjoy dabbling in the volcanic arts, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, there are many other places that are unrelated to volcanoes, like, for instance, uh, when we go to the uh, um, beaches, well, actually, you know, I was going to talk about the Caribbean islands, but those are also related to volcanoes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think we can get away from volcanoes. Yeah. I mean, the people in Europe were very well acquainted with Iceland because of all the uh, flights that were canceled several years ago because of the ash eruptions in Iceland. So we have to worry about these eruptions because they impact our air travel. Some flights have even been downed because of injecting ash into the engines, the jet engines. So currently uh, there are satellites that are monitoring ash in the atmosphere so jets can avoid them. <laughs> By the way, <clears throat> the ashes, they affect not just the uh, traffic uh, that we have in the modern skies, but they affect also history. Uh, I remember I was doing a, a short research uh, at the beginning of the 19th century. So we're around 1812, 1811, and we have a great explosion on the other side of the uh, planet in the Far East. This explosion, uh, it created so much ashes around the globe that they start circulating things to the winds. Uh, for a couple of years, uh, the crops, they were not given any food to the people of that time. And we are already in modern times in Europe. This was one of the many uh, <coughs> reasons why Napoleon, he decided to invade Russia and start the Russian campaign. So uh, Napoleon and the French army, they were very effective in strategically in, his, in their tactics of war, because they have the cavalry, and the horses, they were very, very fast, and they were going on the sides of the enemy, and going faster, and tried to close them, kind of hugging them from behind. Uh, well, what happened in Russia, because of this couple of years, with so many rains, and no sunshine at all, is that it rained, it rained a lot, because the ashes, they create a seed for the little drops of um, water that they, they create the clouds. And uh, it rained so much that this flat land that had to be uh, invaded by the French army, it became mud, like a swamp. And obviously, in uh, that kind of unexpected landscape, the cavalry and the French, the French cavalry couldn't be as fast as they thought. And the Russians could retreat uh, because the French couldn't close uh, in hugging the uh, Russian army. The people were escaping, es escaping going eastward. And that is w one of the several reasons why Napoleon couldn't conclude Strateg uh, strategically his uh, campaign in Russia. Yeah, that was Krakatoa. The Krakatoa. That was the explosion of that volcano on the other side of the planet that affected all of our history because then you have the restoration of uh, what was the old Europe before Napoleon. Then there was Tambora, another Southeast Asian eruption that has uh, a significant art link because it was the uh, reason for the year without the summer in 1816. And it was also the reason that Mary Shelley was hanging out with Lord Byron at his castle. And the weather was so terrible that they were all given the assignment to write a, a short story. And because of the gloom and doom of the weather, she penned Frankenstein. And so we have uh, the Tambora volcano to thank for Frankenstein. Yeah, I remember that. and. Uh I think that um, what happened in there is that they, they were in, in, in uh, what is UK now, right? And in the summers, they enjoyed to go to Switzerland yeah. because it was to the south, a little bit sunnier, a little bit warmer than the UK. But that summer snowed. Yeah. And that was really the moment when Frankenstein yeah. <laughs> came to life yeah. because of the climate. 
So volcanoes can help us. They can give us good things. They give us bentonite, this fantastic material that is added to kitty litter and diapers. So how would we have babies surviving with dry bottoms without volcanoes? Yeah. What? <laughs> you put volcano ashes in babies' diapers? Yes, bentonite. It, it grabs onto the water and it swells and, and holds onto it. So it so keeps why, the... So why do you need the bentonite in the diapers? To keep the diapers dry, to keep the... Uh, to hold onto the water. Hmm. So many uses for, for volcanoes. So good and bad. It's it's a yin-yang story. Okay, so I was thinking about something unrelated to volcanoes, so not the Caribbeans, uh, but let me talk about other beaches. We like to go to the beach, and uh, I remember once I was driving and I arrived to a place called Pensacola. And in that place, the, which is pretty touristic, uh, the beach was white. Mm. White, and I thought it is white because of the calcareous material, but no, that is quartzite. That is coming from the Appalachia uh, mountains. Uh, they arrive there, they accumulate, and they are completely white. And um, tell us, Steve, what is the quartzite? Well, quartz is a very interesting mineral. It's made out of silicon and oxygen at a ratio of two oxygens for every silicon atom in this wonderful molecule. And because of its hardness, quartz survives a long time. So when you erode rocks, quartz from the granites and all these other igneous, metamorphic, and sedimentary rocks uh, forms these individual grains that get transported by rivers and floods and uh, eventually end up at the beach yeah. And the waves winnow away all the fine clays, and you get this beautiful white sand. Uh, yeah, because left behind. The, the currents in that area they are going westward, right? So yeah. the currents they come up northward in Florida within the Gulf, and they they go to the west, and so the currents they they they, they take away the dirty material, the fine grain material. And so these little grains that are a little bit uh, wider and heavier, they remain uh, in what uh, they form a beach. And that is why it becomes so white. And I remember that, I w that when you step on those uh, grains, the sound is completely different than when you are on a beach that is uh, formed by little bioclastic grains. Little shells. Little shells. Like most of the beaches in the Caribbean are made of uh, calcite, calcium carbonate shells. So this is kind of the uh, beaches that we have uh, on the western side of Florida, where you have a lot of uh, seashells. That get broken up. In yeah. So the those are modern, and they are forming the beaches because also in here you have the currents that they're going northward, and they clean up the fine grain sediments and so the water is not uh, turbid and it is clear. Is that right? Yes. And so there's also black sand beaches that are very hard to walk on when the sun is shining because they will hurt your feet. Uh, if you have a black rock that's being eroded and turned into little bits and pieces like in Hawaii you can get beautiful black sands. So the black sands they are derived from the volcanic rocks from basaltic rocks, minerals like olivine and the volcanic glass that's black. And we find them in Hawaii. In Hawaii instance. and other places. Then yeah. we have the white beaches, which are uh, formed by... Either quartz or shell fragments. And where do we find them? We find them mostly in the tropics, where there's a lot of biological activity and atolls so yeah. the, the in places where you don't have rivers that they bring a lot of sediment in and, and the water becomes uh, turbid right like the islands in the caribbean and elsewhere and there are some exceptions like in florida where you have the currents along shore that help yeah uh then sometimes you have like red beaches have you ever heard about beaches being red? Yes. If there's a little bit of iron in the system, the iron stains the quartz grains and other rocks and minerals in the, uh, in the, on the beach, and the, the sands are red. 
And then for what I know, most of the beaches in, in Europe, they are like a golden color, yellowish. And that's because mostly of the clay minerals and the, the, and part of brown color. And ultimately, it's the iron that gives you the brown color. Different shades of red and orange and brown result from just very small amounts of iron, tenths any, of a percent. Any other colors? Uh, it can be green. If the iron is reduced, you can have a green color. Have due, you ever heard about iron. a green... I've seen beach. green sands, yes. Green sands in New Zealand and uh, Hawaii. Uh, and other parts of the world where you have the mineral olivine, which is the gem mineral peridot. It's a magnesium silicate, and it ultimately comes from the mantle, but it also forms in magmatic rocks like basalts. As the magma cools and the olivine settles out and forms these layers that eventually get exposed to the surface and eroded to form green sand beaches. So it seems we have, all, well, blue, blue is missing. Is it possible uh, to I, have blue? I know of no blue beaches. That's Why don't a good we have point. blue? Because we don't have blue rocks? There, there are blue rocks. There are beautiful blue rocks. Yeah, many copper minerals are blue. Uh, azurite and uh, other copper type minerals. Uh, but you don't get many blue beaches. Yeah, you don't. No. But I, I've seen a beach. Do you know which color? The color of the rainbow. No. Can you imagine Multicolored. that? Multicolored. Multicolor. Uh, and the instead of being um, sand size, a uh, grain size, instead of being sand, the beach was made by pebbles. Mm. So maybe one inch, half an inch, uh, and they were rounded. Mm. Do you know what happened? This beach was in uh, north, uh, west of Italy, in Livorno, close to Pisa, where mm. you have the tower of Pisa. Ah very close to there. Well, Livorno is a port, and in the port you have a lot of ships that they arrive, and they arrive from all over the world, and sometimes they bring minerals, and they may bring minerals from Far East, from uh, South America, from North of Europe, or from the Mediterranean Sea. And then when they wash the interior of the ships, some of these minerals, they come out and they're lost. Uh. And all of a sudden, they accumulate in a specific spot, and they wow. give this a weird beach where you find all sort of minerals. Amazing. Just think about those um, places when you go to a, a, a fair or a conference and you find all of these uh, stands that they sell you, little stones from one, two or three dollars, mm -hmm. that they are very colorful. Just mm -hmm. imagine like mixing all of them. Oh, wow. Amazing. Well, you can go to the Pacific Coast, and because of all the glaciation, the beaches are very uh, high energy, and you have big waves, and you have large pebbles and cobbles, and they also have many colors because of the, the nature of the rocks. Every shade of yellow and green and red and orange. What else? Where do we go now? Well, we should go to New Zealand. Because New Zealand has an amazing diversity of landscapes. It's, it's very far south in the southern hemisphere, and you have one of the few places where you have a temperate rainforest right next to a mountain glacier. So glaciers form on the South Island near uh, the, the Alpine Fault, another plate boundary, this big strike slip fault that's very similar to the San Andreas. And the that particular fault has uplifted the, the South, South Island to very high elevations, enough to stabilize glaciers. And so the glaciers flow out of the mountains and enter the sea. And you don't have to go very far to find a rainforest and glaciers flowing into the sea. And then you also have the benefit of volcanoes, some big calderas on the North Island, and you have very young active volcanoes like Narahoe and Ruapehu and Egmont and uh, they, they have a huge number of uh, hot springs and geysers like they call them there. Uh, in fact the Maori civilization uses the geysers to cook their food and the hot springs. Uh, and um, talking about glacials, there's another spectacular place 
were also, I think Americans, they go there as well. The wealthy people, they can go on a cruise, arrive to the southern tip of the South America and see the Perito Moreno Glacial, uh, which is um, a glacial uh, that arrives to a lake. The lake erodes the lower part and it creates arches. And then it is spectacular when the the arches that are created, they create like bridges, they fall apart. And you see them and you can film them. Mm. And um, this is a glacial where steel is uh, growing in volume, one of the few, because most of the glaciers today, they're decreasing in volume. Mm. And so you can see this repeated and repeated again, because there's always more and more volume. And so more and more of these processes of erosion of the water underneath, and then the collapse of the bridges they form above. Mm. Glacier Bay in Alaska has similar, the Columbia Glacier and other glaciers up in uh, the north. In talking about uh, bridges, also there's uh, this National Park, natural bridges? Mm -hmm. Natural bridges. Yes. Those uh, bridges are formed in um, Aeolian um, formations. Or Sandstones. Shallow, shallow water formations. Yeah. Yes. So in that case, the, ar the arches, they uh, form because Obviously, there's erosion. There's erosion by water, by wind, and then there's some special cementation along some parts of the rock that is eroded, and that is the part that forms the upper part of the arch, which is the bridge, which forms the bridge. And that is how you can erode underneath it, because above is uh, more cemented than below. And harder and stronger than the soft shales below. Yeah, which is something similar also to uh, what happened in Monu Monument Valley. Mm. All of these movies, the Western movies, where you have the buttes, mm. right? Yes. Buttes and mesas. Yes. So if it is small, it's a butte. If it is larger, it's a mesa. Yes. And you have the buttes that there are these beautiful columns. They, they go up, up, and then they get wider, and they have kind of a cup. And so um, that is generally um, eroded by rivers. They start eroding the upper part that is a formation that is well cemented. And then there is a contact with the formation below that is weaker and it is uh, easily erodible by rivers that they pass through, water, wind. And so you have a very strong, well cemented cap on top then a sharp contact, and then below you have a weaker uh, unit, probably more clay rich, that is uh, easily eroded, and and it remains in place. It and forms it, uh, the slopes. Forms the slopes. Yep. Hmm. Mount Roraima in Brazil is a similar feature, where you get this huge, uh, nine thousand foot tall plateau, this big mesa that is in juxtaposition to this Amazon rainforest. And so you can sit at the top of the plateau and look down on the clouds and all the rainforest jungle. Uh, it, it, it's in Brazil and Guiana and Venezuela. It's magical. In, in, in talking about Brazil, do you know anything about the uh, Pan de Azúcar? Uh, the, the, what is this, hill where you have Jesus with open arms. Oh, in <laughs> Rio de Janeiro? Yes. In that I have never visited it, but yeah, I think. Tell I, me about it. I don't know. I would like to know. <laughs> Next time we have another guest talking about that. I don't know. This kind of pinnacles coming up and down. I think could be. Uh, They're igneous. granites. They're yeah, igneous rocks. Igneous. Yeah, 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 yeah. And they've been uplifted because of melting of of the mantle. Another igneous process, uh, and it's been uplifted fairly recently. Only fifty or forty million years ago. Okay. No, I'm curious about that because cyclists, they like it a lot. Mm. You, you are very <laughs> you know, rugged. In Rio de Janeiro, you go to the beach and then if you want to, generally, if you're at the beach, it's difficult to um, use your bicycle in a mountain, right? If, especially if you think about Houston. Yeah. <laughs> but there are some places in the world where you can do it. And that is a, a funny one uh, in Rio de Janeiro. 
And uh, okay, where do we go now? So we should go to Kentucky because we haven't talked about caves yet. Caves are amazing. There, there are so many caves around the world where groundwater has percolated through the subterranean masses and has dissolved out the rock, mostly calcite and, and limestone is the mineral that is the rock and mineral that's being dissolved. But the Mammoth Cave in Kentucky is uh, the longest cave in the world. It's over a thousand miles of subterranean passageways. 160 kilometers. Thousand miles. Oh, thousand miles? <laughs> 1,600 kilometers. Oh. <laughs> It's a network. It's not just one continuous, oh, okay. long stretch. It, I, it's all interconnected. It's, it doesn't count. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't count. <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, you can stand in these huge cavern uh, uh, rooms and see the, the magnificent formations that have formed the stalactites and so, stalagmites. So tell us how, how the cave opened. How does it open? So it opens because of rainfall uh, that... Uh, is anomalous and uh, it, at certain times in the Earth's past you have massive amounts of rain and because of the carbon dioxide in the air that eventually dissolves in the water to form carbonic acid the calcium carbonate or limestone dissolves as the groundwater percolates through it and you f start by dripping small little bits of water along cracks and eventually these cracks open up and uh, get larger and and you form subterranean rivers and uh, the more water that passes through the the bigger the the cave opening gets and sometimes they come to the surface and you can discover them other times they're hidden and you you don't even know they're there and unless you can remotely sense them so this process is called uh, is the karst karstism the term that we use in geology is karst so, uh, it forms all sorts of strange features due so, to the dissolution of limestone uh, some are pinnacles that stick up there's some fantastic places in the world where in fact we just saw two days ago we we visited in uh, Langtree uh, some strange pinnacle type formations. So the karst it occurs only in limestones. It can occur in other rocks, but mostly in limestones. So because well, of the calcium carbonate, it's easily dissolved by uh, groundwater. Okay, and uh, <clears throat> do you know where the word derives from? No. So the etymology of uh, karst uh, is pretty easy. It comes from the German, and um, and uh, it is apply to an area in uh, what is now northeast Italy uh, is a region called Carso and uh, it is infamous because of the very the first world war and in the Carso which is carbonate mm -hmm. uh, they dig the trenches just think about how difficult it wow. was Wow! and in there you had um, many of these uh, caves and uh, and sinkholes, and the very first time they were studied there by the um, in the Austro-Hungaric Empire, so mm. uh, they call it Karst. And from that area uh, in Italian Carso, in uh, uh, German Karst, it derives the process. So another Karst feature that I really enjoy visiting is the Karst of Halong Bay in Vietnam where you get these huge isolated spires of islands, uh, hundreds of them in the north of the uh, Gulf of Tonkin. And you can go and visit them. They have a lot of caves. And it's because of the, the recent uplift that has allowed for erosion of all the uh, limestone. And, and if I, another important thing when we talk about the caves is the water table. Where is the water table? Yes. Because, uh, for instance, in uh, Florida, and in the uh, carbonate that you have all over Florida, the water table is pretty high. And that is the reason why you have uh, sinkholes that sometimes they open and they're full of water. Yeah. In Yucatan, in Mexico, it is similar, uh, larger, but similar to the Florida 
uh, rocks. And you also have sinkholes, but when they open, they're dry mm. because Yucatan is more elevated or let's say relatively, let's say that the water table is lower. So sinkholes are a problem and they're a problem here in the United States a lot. Yes. Right? I think that sinkholes, they swallow cars and houses. Yeah, many of these sinkholes are natural like Daniel was talking about, but many of them are man-made because uh, pipes break and they erode a lot of the rocks and soil underground and that creates man-made sinkholes. <laughs> so we have both Mother Nature and man-made sinkholes that are a problem. And then uh, in other places where you have carbon, like the Edwards Plateau here in Texas, uh, you don't really have sinkholes, and that is mainly because you don't really have that much uh, karst because you don't have that much water. Well, believe it or not, right along the edge of the Edwards Plateau, along the Balcones Escarpment, there are many uh, caverns. You can visit the Natural Bridge Caverns near Austin, and uh, it's because of the fractures associated with the Balcones Fault. So tell us, where is the Balcones Fault? Can you draw it in, yes, in, in, in a it, sketch in radio? If you just think of your state of Texas and connect Dallas with Austin and then swing around to San Antonio, uh, you have the Balcones Escarpment. And you can stand on one side of the Balcones Escarpment that's been uplifted and look to the east and see the coastal plain of the Gulf of Mexico. And to the west, you see the Edwards Plateau. And this escarpment is formed by the Austin Chalk as well, a, a, a younger formation on top of the Edwards formation. And because of the uplift that's taken place, you have the carbonates along the fractured Balcones structure being dissolved to form the natural bridge caverns. And if you follow the trend to the west, eventually you'll get into New Mexico and to Carlsbad Caverns which is another magnificent cavern to visit west of uh, Big Bend. And, then. And, uh, and that is the reason, the, because of the Balcones Fault, is that the reason why we have water flowing out <clears throat> in those areas that kind of springs? Yes. And they form pools yes. when we go there in summertime? Yes. Is that maybe the same reason why we have uh, Austin and San Antonio founded there as cities because there's water. Yeah, the escarpment uh, was a, a, a major reason why a lot of the development has taken place. So, well, do, you, do you know when the, the escarpment, escarpment uh, form? The or, current understanding is that it's about 10 million years old. Okay. So it, 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 a while back, uh, long before man was on the planet, long before man evolved. Early man settled the area probably 30 or 40,000 years ago. But the Our ancestors. Um, yeah, the Australopithecus in between four and three million years ago. But they were in Africa. They weren't here. <laughs> All right. They hadn't made it to North America yet. Just to put things in perspective, remember, the planet is around uh, exactly what? 4.55 billion 4. years. 4.5 billion, billion years. And man is around three four million years. Well, the Australopithecus in yeah. Africa. And then we have the Homo sapiens, which is few tens of thousands of years ago. What else? Where do we go before we uh, uh, reach the eight o'clock hour here in KPFT HD3 channel Houston in beautiful Montrose with mini geology radio show talking about uh, geo geology and geoscientists and geoscience and uh, today we're talking with Steve Bergman about the beauty and the scenic uh, um, landscapes that we have and we visit as, as tourists. So where do we go now? Well I would be remiss if I neglected to mention Old Oenyo Langai. Oh my gosh. <laughs> this is a fantastic place. It is in Tanzania and it's the only active carbonatite volcano. Baking soda is bubbling out, molten baking soda is bubbling out of this volcano at a temperature of 450 degrees Fahrenheit. And at night, the lavas glow a very dull red because it's not hot enough to be a bright red like the basalt lavas. Uh, this volcano is amazing. It's associated with the East African Rift 
where we have the Somalia plate moving east away from Africa, and we have this huge rift valley, and we have the strange rift volcanoes of the East African rift. That's why we have the lakes. Well, that's why we have the lakes as well. They're because infilling. Of the, they're infilling the rift valley. And Oldowendio Langai means mountain of God in the local language. So do you recommend to go there and visit? I strongly recommend. It's a fairly safe volcano. No one has ever died, as far as I know. Do you need a visa uh, to go there? Yes, you do. You need a visa to go there. And it, it, it's a long hike. You have, to, you have to climb up this huge mountain. But it's worth the, the hike because the, the anomaly is amazing. To, to see these black lavas bubble out, they, they're like tar lavas. And then you wait a day and the black uh, bicarbonate turns white because it oxidizes. And uh, it's, you get these little bubbling mud pots and short little lava flows and all happening in the middle of Tanzania. Tell us something more before we go. Uh, back to the United States. Let's go to the uh, Northwest. Okay. Uh, what about the Mount St. Helens? Mount St. Helens is uh, a, a fantastic place, and it's it, uh, publicly uh, accessible today. If you were there May 18th, 1980, uh, you, it wasn't very accessible because it erupted, and the top 400 meters was blasted off of the top of the volcano. But now we're able to climb to the top of the rim of Mount St. Helens crater and look inside. Isn't it dangerous? Uh, no, not really. I, I did it myself. What, what does it happen when you look inside? What is inside a volcano? Uh, when you look at a from crater, the rim? you're looking at a crater with a dome, and the dome is still steaming, even though it's 37 years old. So, but when you are on the rim and you look downward inside into the volcano, how deep is that hole? The the hole is over a thousand feet deep. And it, it's filled by this massive dome of uh, ash and uh, uh, dacite lavas that have slowly oozed out what in 2004. It, what does it, it happen if you, if you fall down? You would hurt yourself. It's, it's very rugged, so I, I wouldn't say that it's the safest place in the world, but it is. you can be safe and you can survive. But, but can climb. you go inside? You're not allowed to go inside. Only the geologists uh, okay, from so the U.S. You, Geological Survey can go inside. And they can go inside. They can go inside, and they're studying it. You have to go inside. They take helicopters and land, and so they're, they're safer because of the helicopters. Uh, what about the crater lake? Oregon. Crater Lake in Oregon is amazing because it's the deepest lake in, in North America. How deep is it? It's over 594 uh, meters deep. Oh, it, thank you. We are in meters now. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's 1,949 feet for, for those English people. It was formed about 7,000 years ago by the... Uh, this huge caldera eruption that blasted the top off of that volcano and formed uh, the, this deep crater. Uh, what about uh, Finger Lakes? Finger Lakes, yes, carved out by glaciers, much like the rest of the uh, Great Lakes uh, in New York. Uh, But they, why do they have the, this shape, like the fingers? They're like old fjords that have been filled with water. Um, and so the glaciers scoured out um, a hole as they moved south away from the Canadian uh, Laurentian ice sheet just uh, 20,000 years ago and, and carved out these long finger cavern or ca uh, uh, channels. Well, so we have seen so many processes. We went from earthquakes to volcanoes, a lot of volcanoes, but then also coastal processes and uh, glacials and karst. So thank you so much to Steve Bergman here with us at KPFT HD3 channel in Houston. This is Mini Geology Radio Show, right at Mini Geology, M-I-N-I -I, Geology, at gmail.com come and visit the Facebook page and the, you can tweet with us. So now it's time to uh, move on and uh, this is all. Thank you, Daniel. Bye, Steve. Ciao, bye.